Good morning, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> I'll try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. It's with my daughter's kindergarten class, I learned those skills. Um, I am thrilled to welcome you and our online audience and those listening concurrently and later. I am have the great honor and privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute. My name is Sarah Rosen Wartell. So before we talk about why we're here today, let me do a few notes of housekeeping for our blended hybrid audience. Um, we have uh, guests who are watching now and will be watching online. If you are joining online, we have closed captions enabled, and you can also submit questions or comments for the speakers in the Q&A box. You can also turn the closed caption off if you would like. For those of you who are in the room, you can scan the QR codes that are placed on each of your tables. And by using that, it'll pop open something that you can use to submit questions as well. This event is being recorded. And the recording and relevant links to the different part papers and the materials that are discussed during the presentation will be available on our website thereafter. We'll also be sharing a link to a post-event survey, and we do ask that you share feedback. It's how we make these events and the experience in this hybrid environment um, more effective for everyone. We would also encourage you to join a conversation online if you would like, using whatever social media platform you currently tolerate. Uh, you can use the hashtag live at urban, and if you do, others will be able to be part of that conversation as you react to things you're seeing and hearing. So logistics behind us, I want to thank you for being here. And I want to extend a very special thanks to our partners who helped make this possible. First, the team from USC Saul Price School of Public Policy, led by Dana Goldman. Thank you, Dana, for being with us and for this, helping us pull this together. And to Jack Rowe of Columbia University, who in addition to being the studies lead, one of the study's lead authors and will moderate our conversation today, Jack is also, we're lucky to say, one of the Urban Institute's trustees. Um, thanks, Jack, for all that you do uh, to help us better understand uh, critical questions for the lives of Americans. Thanks also to our panelists and our presenters. We have Jack Chappelle, David Rakoff, Wendell Primus, Edwin Tan, Tismarie Sherry, and Jung Choi of Urban. So today we are talking about the goal that so many of us aspire to, especially as you get to be my age, a long and healthy life, and one that is increasingly available to some of us, to those who can afford it. Well, it, to many, it may not be news that lower income Americans face worse life outcomes. New research from USC and Columbia shows that this pattern is no longer limited to those with the lowest incomes. While healthy life expectancy has increased for the upper middle class, lower middle class Americans are worse off than their counterparts two decades ago. And if you think about it, we tend to talk about trends and phenomena that happen in our society at the median. Life expectancy is getting longer or during the pandemic getting shorter. Um, but actually what we know at Urban is that if you really want to try to address challenges, you really need to understand not the median, but the experiences of all kinds of different parts of our population, whether those differences are based on their income, as we're talking about here, or race, or what part of the country they live in, or what their degree of social engagement is, lots of other things. And to remedy some of the challenges people face, you need to understand the drivers, and the drivers may be different for people depending upon their circumstances in life. And that's what our goal is, first to look at this great insight that we've gained from this new work, and then begin to try to unpack why it might be happening and what we could do about it. So these phenomena are bringing challenges for many near re retirees. The programs that support them and their families, those people whose future life outcomes depend on their parents and grandparents. Think about the ability to invest in your kids' housing or um, a small business or education. The data shows a growing gap between the upper and middle lower class across most life outcomes. And as you'll hear soon, between the early 90s and today, earnings have increased 27% for the upper middle class and fallen 5% for the lower middle class. 
The lower middle class has seen a sharper drop in home ownership, and they are less likely to have employer-sponsored health insurance and have more chronic health conditions. Between 1994 and 2018, life expectancy at age 60, which is perilously close to mine, increased twice as much for the upper middle class as for the lower middle class. At a time when policymakers are considering things like raising the Social Security retirement age, it's important to consider the implications for different groups of near retirees. And this research helps us to demonstrate why we need to pay particular attention to those whose incomes may exclude them from some of the safety net and social supports that our society provides. And yet those same individuals are not prepared for this part of their later life in the way that others at an earlier time may have been. Quality life expectancy is not the result of one policy, one program, one social phenomenon, but rather the confluence of all kinds of different factors that affect health, earnings, wealth building, and economic stability. And it's really important for us to unpack the drivers of these if we're going to be diagnosing solutions. There's also perhaps some we can learn from other countries whose life expectancies largely exceed those of us here in America. And we're not so good always in the United States at being interested in what others have to teach us. But here, especially as my colleague Laudie Aaron has been teaching us for almost two decades now, um, we really have a lot to learn from other places. There's more work for us to do to understand these differences by lots of different dis um, and understand disparities, whether by race, ethnicity, disability, region, and how policies and practices combined to allow people to thrive or not. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So first, we're going to hear two uh, uh, short um, insights from the work. And then we'll have Jack and a wonderful group of panelists join us for a discussion. Thank you all for being here. I can't wait to learn uh, what we can today. Thank you. Jack? OK, well, thanks for that introduction. Uh, I'm, ex I'm excited to present our work on the Forgotten Middle, uh, which is joint with uh, Brian Tysinger, uh, Dana Goldman, Jack Rowe, and the Research Network on an Aging Society. Uh, so there's two kind of broad trends that uh, kind of set the stage for our study. Uh, so the first is that the US is quickly transitioning to an aging society. And so what we mean by that is that the number of people, uh, older people over age 60 is outstripping the number of younger children under age 15. And so this is the result of uh, trends that are common across many developed countries where people are living longer and having fewer children. Uh, and it's been hastened by the recent aging of the large baby boom generation. And so with this aging society can come uh, additional new challenges related to uh, future caregiving and productivity. And so it's important that we anticipate what challenges we might face as our society ages. And then the second broad trend is what some people have called a shrinking middle class. And so uh, one common way that people define the middle class is to take the median income and then say, let's take everyone with more than half this income, uh, but less than double it and call that the middle class. So if we look at the uh, size of this population as a percent of the total, uh, we see it's been decreasing slowly over time. Uh, so it's important as we transition to this aging society that we uh, understand what uh, supports the middle class might need so that we can continue to foster a uh, prosperous and healthy middle class into, uh, uh, into older age. And so this study, we're examining the health and economic well-being of middle-income Americans who are nearing retirement age. Uh, and so we're really focused on the middle of the economic distribution here. And so there's been a lot of attention on uh, inequities related to the top and bottom of the economic ladder, like the uh, inequities of the 1% or the supports that the most vulnerable populations might need. Uh, but many in the middle may be struggling as well. Many of them have modest incomes but don't uh, quite uh, qualify for public assistance. Uh, so we want to look at how are these people faring in their health uh, and are there health disparities within this middle of the economic distribution as well. And then the main part of our paper is answering the question, how do we expect these people's uh, future health and econo economic well-being to evolve over their later life? Uh, so how long will they live? What potential uh, care challenges might, might they face? Uh, and then finally, to what extent have these outcomes and uh, potential disparities changed over time and what are the trends? 
Okay, so to give you a brief overview of uh, where we'll be going today, I'll give a very quick overview of the methods that we use. Uh, then we'll look at the health and economic well-being of uh, Americans when they're in midlife, in their mid-50s, and when we observe them in the data. And then we'll project, using a microsimulation model, their future uh, health outcomes and, and future life course outcomes. Okay. Uh, so again, our, our, our main purpose is to uh, examine the health and economic well-being of Americans who are in their mid-50s and approaching retirement. And so we first uh, get five cohorts of Americans who are aged 53 to 58 uh, in 2018 and compare them to similarly aged cohorts uh, in 2012, 2006, all the way back to 1994. Um, and for all of this, we're using health and retirement study data, which is a nationally representative uh, longitudinal survey of, of older Americans. Uh, and then we're going to be defining socioeconomic status groups within these cohorts, uh, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, so then we'll describe their health and ec economic outcomes when we observe them in the data in their age, when they're age 53 to 58. Then we'll use what's called a dynamic microsimulation model uh, to, pr uh, to take these midlife outcomes and project them into the future, and we'll uh, compare trends over time and uh, disparities. Okay, so the first step uh, in defining economic status is uh, defining what we, what we mean by economic status. And so uh, commonly, a commonly used measure is to take people's income. Uh, for our population of older individuals who are nearing retirement, income alone might not be quite adequate because there may be people who have very large wealth holdings but uh, have lower observed incomes. And so we don't want to misclassify them as having low economic status. So instead, we use a measure that we call the annual resources, which we've adapted from some other studies. And so this measure combines income as well as the annualized value of their wealth. And so specifically, we take uh, a household's pre-tax income, uh, adjust that to the individual level, and then we take the household's net wealth and multiply it by an annuity factor. And so this annuity factor translates the stock of wealth into a flow that you would get if you took all of your wealth and took out an annuity on it. And so this can be kind of considered as the uh, resources that an individual has on an annual basis. So then with our metric defined, we next define our groups of interest. Um, and so we define our groups based on percentiles of this annual resources distribution. And so again, we're interested mainly in the middle. So we first uh, decide what is the lower cutoff for that middle group. And we choose the 15th percentile of the annual resources. And we choose this percentile because on average across the cohorts that we looked at, uh, this approximately lined up with about 138% of the poverty line. And this is a common, uh, this is uh, the threshold used for Medicaid eligibility. And we think this is a, a good lower bound to identify people who are you know, just on the margin maybe of being eligible for public programs. Uh, then for the top end, we choose the 75th percentile. And we choose this percentile because it approximately aligned on average across the cohorts uh, with 200% of the median. Uh, and this has been a commonly used uh, uh, threshold to identify the middle class on the upper end. Uh, so we focus on this middle group, and then we split it in half into a lower middle and an upper middle. And these two groups are going to be our main groups of interest for the rest of the presentation. So uh, the lower middle and the upper middle. OK, so now that we've defined our groups, uh, we'll look at uh, what their health and economic status looks like in the data when we observe them when they're age 53 to 58. So starting with their annual resources, uh, we see in the top bar in red, the lower middle in 1994, on average, had uh, about 38,000 in annual resources. Uh, for the upper middle, this value in 1994 was about 78,000. Uh, now for the lower middle, across the cohorts, you see it peaked in the 2000 cohort and then started to uh, decline thereafter, especially uh, between 2006 and 2012 following the Great Recession. Uh, and then it continued to decline and in 2018, uh, their annual resources were lower than uh, a similar cohort in 1994. For the upper middle, on the other hand, uh, they also had a slight decline following the Great Recession, but it since bounced back, and they now have about 12,000 more annual resources on average than similar cohorts in 1994. So as a result, uh, we see that the gap in average annual resources between the upper and lower middle has expanded from about 40,000 uh, in 1994 
to about 60,000 uh, in 2018. Now, if we add taxes and transfers to the equation, we see that uh, annual resources for the lower middle does not really change much. So they don't have very high tax liabilities, but they also aren't getting uh, a, a ton of additional income from public supports. Uh, for the upper middle, they have some tax liability, and that brings their annual resources down a bit. Uh, but we still see uh, a similar pattern where the lower middle is left with uh, fewer annual resources in 2018 compared to the 1994 cohort whereas the upper middle has uh, still about almost 10,000 more. And so again, we have a widening gap. So work and earnings is the main source of income for these groups. If we look at women, we see uh, employment rate has been uh, pretty comparable and slightly increasing for women. Uh, but for men, we've seen a, slight, a, a decline in employment among men in the lower middle. Uh, whereas it's continued to stay steady, slightly increasing for the upper middle. If we then look at how much they're earning if they are working, uh, we see for both men and women in the upper middle, there's been continued steady gains in, in earnings. Uh, but for the lower middle, for women, it's pretty stagnant, and for men, it's maybe even decreasing. Um, so for women, they're working a little bit more, but not earning much more. And for men, they're working less and maybe earning a little bit less as well. If we look at home ownership next, uh, home ownership is uh, pretty much the main source of wealth for the middle class Americans. In 1994, we saw pretty comparable rates of home ownership uh, with the vast majority owning their home. Uh, but ownership, ownership began to decline uh, after the 2000s and very quickly for the lower middle, such that only a little over half of them owned their home by 2018. And so as a result, the gap in the home ownership rate between the upper middle and lower middle has tripled from 10 percentage points in 1994 to 30 percentage points uh, in 2018. And the next looking at health insurance. Uh, so health insurance rates were pretty, uh, pretty steady uh, uh, in the mid 90 percent for the upper middle. Uh, but for the lower middle, it started to decline after the 2000s, especially driven by pretty quickly declining employer-sponsored health insurance in this data. Uh, you see that between 2012 and 2018, there was an increase in health insurance um, for the lower middle. And this is probably due to changes from the Affordable Care Act, such as the establishment of marketplaces. Um, and so it seems that you know, we've, we've made a little bit of progress helping shore up that health insurance, but it wasn't nearly enough to recover them all the way back to the same levels of coverage uh, that they saw in the 1994 cohort. Uh, so that's some of their uh, health, their economic status when they're age in their 50s, but now let's look at some of their health factors. Uh, so starting with health risk factors, we see that the rates of smoking have remained pretty elevated for the lower middle group at around 25 to 30 percent. Sorry, the axes are a little bit, uh, uh, are not equal there, so pay attention to the axes. But um, so smoking rate has has remained elevated for the lower middle, uh, whereas in the same time period for the upper middle, smoking rates were cut in half. Interestingly, uh, obesity was one of the areas that we did not see a widening of the gradient, uh, but this is because both groups have been uh, increasing obesity pretty quickly, and so we have a pretty broad uh, obesity epidemic uh, that needs to be addressed, I think. So this then translates to the number of diagnosed chronic conditions that people have. And so again, this has been increasing broadly across the middle income population. But we see that it's been increasing faster among the lower middle. And they already started with slightly higher uh, uh, rates of chronic disease in 1994. Uh, so in the end, we again have a, a widening gap in the chronic disease burden, uh, although it's been rising for everyone. And then finally, this translates and is reflected in people's own subjective sense of their own health and well-being. And so for the lower middle, we see that uh, people reporting that their health is only fair or poor has increased from 22% up to 30%. So almost a third of people in the lower middle think that their health is fair or poor. Uh, whereas for the upper middle, there's been a slight increase uh, from 10% to 13%, uh, but still we see a widening gradient here in people's own subjective sense of their own health. 
And this is probably due to what we saw before, rising chronic diseases, um, et cetera. Okay, so that's their uh, health and economic status when we observe them in the data when they're in their 50s. Uh, so the next step uh, in the main part of our paper is now taking this health and economic status and uh, projecting how that will translate into future life years. And we do this using a micro simulation model. And so I'm not going to get into much details of how the micro simulation model works, but just to give you a very basic uh, sense, uh, 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 it's based on, we estimate relationships based on the last 20 years of data uh, into what we call transition models. And these transition models take people's demographics, their health status, and uh, their economic status in one period, and then predict forward what, that, what we predict their health status will be in the next period. So we take our, our populations from the data and enter them into the simulation based on their observed characteristics, and then we simulate their life forward uh, one period at a time all the way until death. And so we do this for each individual many times, and we take the average, and, uh, and, that's, and in that sense, we, uh, we get their expected future outcomes. And so we estimate both how long people will live and also uh, the, 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 general health, uh, the general health status that each of those life years will have. So if we look first at life expectancy uh, among men, we see that life expectancies have been increasing for both groups, which is good, uh, but the increase has been about twice as fast for the upper middle. Um, so this is life expectancy at age 60. So just to read the first graph a little slower, in 1994, we project that lower middle men uh, will live about 19 years. So if they survive to age 60, we project they'll live till age 79 on average. Uh, for the upper middle, we project in 1994 that they live about a year and a half longer. Uh, in 2018, we see both groups increase. The, the lower middle are living about a year longer, uh, but the upper middle are living almost two and a half years longer. So again, this gap has increased over time uh, from about a one and a half year difference in life expectancy in 1994 uh, to more than two and a half years in 2018. Um, now that's just purely how long someone will live, but now we also want to consider uh, the health quality of that life. And so, uh, the, we first take a somewhat crude measure of disability-free life years. And so disability here is pretty broadly defined as reporting that you have a functional limitation that uh, requires some assistance of some daily activities of life. Um, and we see here that uh, the number of years that we project someone will live without one of these disabilities uh, for the lower middle has actually slightly decreased from 12.9 to 12.6 between the cohorts. So even though they're living longer lives, uh, these life expectancy gains are completely uh, from uh, additional life years lived with a disability. Now, for the upper middle, uh, they have gained uh, they have gained uh, almost a year of disability-free life years. But notice that it's not quite as much as the total life year gain, and so uh, we expect they'll be gaining some additional disability-free life years as well as disabled life years. And so what this means, especially for the lower middle, is that uh, they're living longer lives, but a much larger proportion of that uh, life expectancy will be in poorer health. Uh, looking now at women, uh, we see pretty similar patterns. We see gains in overall life expectancy for both groups. Uh, the gains are not quite as large for women as they are for men, partly because women started out already with a higher life expectancy than men. Uh, but again, we see a similar pattern where the gains are uh, about almost twice as fast for uh, women in the upper middle than in the lower middle. If we look then at their disability-free life years, again, we see the lower middle uh, has had a pretty significant decrease in disability-free life years. But actually, with, with the upper middle, uh, they also have not really gained disability-free life years for women. Um, now, disability-free life years is a little bit of a crude measure for uh, the healthfulness of someone's future life. And so we next look at our preferred measure, which is the quality, quality adjusted life expectancy. And so what this is, is for each year of their simulated life, we take their uh, what chronic diseases they have, their functional limitations, obesity, things like that, and we uh, convert it into an index called a quality adjusted life year, which is commonly used in the medical literature. Uh, and so this index ranges from zero to one, where one is a year of perfect health and zero is death. And so we weight each of their future life years by a quality adjusted life year to get their quality adjusted life expectancy. 
And what we see here is for women in the upper middle, uh, there's been about a 0.5 year gain in this measure. Uh, so not, not a ton, but still, still going up. Uh, but for women in the lower middle, it's begun to slightly decline. Uh, and so they are left with about 0.3 less quality adjusted life years in 2018 than 1994. For men in the upper middle, uh, there's been quite, quite a lot of gain um, in quality adjusted life expectancy, an 8.5% change. Uh, but for men in the lower middle, after some, uh, a similar trend for the first couple cohorts, it started to decline after 2006, and now they are left with a hardly higher quality adjusted life expectancy in the 2018 cohort compared to the 1994 cohort. Um, so finally, we take uh, so finally we take the uh, future future economic outcomes that we project to estimate the total value of the future resources that they will have in their total later life. So we start off with their net wealth when they're age sixty, uh, and then use, through the simulation, each year we have the total income that we estimate they will make. And so we convert all that future flow of income back down into a stock, so the present value of all of their future income to compare it to wealth, and we add that to this value. And then we, and so this is just with private income. And then next we add, uh, do the same thing, but with public income, such as Social Security, uh, which many people rely on in their later life for income. And what we see here is that once we've added up uh, their current stock of wealth at, at age 60 and their expected future flow of income, that total value for the lower middle is about the same in 2018 as it was in 1994. So it started increasing, it was, it was higher in, in 2000 and peaked in 2006, uh, and then uh, receded again after the Great Recession and has not recovered. Meanwhile, for the upper middle, uh, we see that uh, they've continued to gain and uh, now have almost uh, about 200,000 more in this total value of resources available for their later life. Okay, so to conclude, uh, for most of the measures we looked at, we found a, a, a gap between the lower and upper middle that was widening for almost all of the outcomes that we looked at. Uh, and so for the lower middle, for economic outcomes, this was often uh, a result of either stagnation or decline among economic outcomes for the lower middle, while the upper middle continued to gain or at least were steady. Uh, we saw a pretty broadly rising chronic disease burden, uh, but that was much faster in the lower middle. And this then translated to uh, widening gaps in their life expectancy uh, and especially their healthy life expectancy. Uh, an important uh, implication is that we are estimating a decompression of morbidity. So uh, what we mean by this is uh, longer life expectancies, but a larger proportion of that uh, life in poor health or disability. And this, uh, we project, is quickly and more quickly affecting the lower middle group. And so ultimately, we're projecting that the lower middle face a significant future healthcare needs uh, but we project that they will have no more economic resources to address these needs than previous cohorts. Uh, meanwhile, for the upper middle, you know, I think, we'll, I think they'll have uh, some additional healthcare needs as well, but we project that they'll have significantly more economic resources as well to help them address it. And then finally, of course, our study ends in 2018, and obviously there's been some changes since then. Uh, so most obviously we had the coronavirus pandemic, and we know that that disproportionately impacted lower income populations or just otherwise underserved populations. Uh, there were also some expansions of uh, safety net programs that occurred during this time, although some of them ended up being just temporary expansions. Uh, and then we have also seen both before and after the pandemic, uh, finally wage growth picking up, especially towards the bottom of the economic distribution. Uh, and so this was really good news, but at the same time, we've also had this bout of inflation that might wipe out those gains. Um, and so, uh, and we've also seen continuing rising in house, house prices. Uh, so I think it'll be great to hear what the panel thinks about uh, what we can do about these trends and what changes might have happened since the end of our study and yeah, how we can solve this going forward. Uh, so thank you and I'll take any questions that we might have.
I know you didn't do demographic breakdowns, mm -hmm. but you probably do know something about the shift in the demographic composition of those cohorts at the four different mm -hmm. periods. Um, do you think some of that affects some of these factors at all? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, we didn't put it in the presentation, but uh, yeah, so the proportion of the population that is non-Hispanic white uh, is higher in the upper middle and uh, has decreased for both populations, but a little bit more for the lower middle. Uh, in terms of education, the upper middle is slightly more educated. They're about 30% uh, with a college degree in 2018, which is about the population average. Uh, actually, maybe above the population. Yeah, about the population average. And it's a little bit uh, lower for the lower middle, but both groups gained uh, uh, education over time. Um, and then there's been some decline in, in marriage uh, in, in both groups, but a little bit more in the lower middle group. Um, yeah. Um, I had a similar question, so thank you for, for asking it, but also was wondering, so obviously for, with a, coming with a health policy lens, you know, we go to what are potential health policy solutions to, some, to addressing some of the um, disparities that you raised, um, but also curious whether or not you have explored or are considering exploring some of the, you know, previous policies that may have led to some of these increasing divides um, within or, or outside of the healthcare space. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think uh, all kinds of policies are, uh, especially, so these are people, we observe them in their 50s, but of course policy through their life course can impact their resources, and th so things like child care, housing policy definitely I think can have an impact. Um, and I hope that the panel might speak a little bit more about these drivers uh, uh, when we get to there, and also some potential future solutions. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. I have two um, quick questions. One was like, when you look at the earning disparities, I was wondering how much of that can be explained by um, technology. And, and, and then the other question that I had was, I think also you mentioned just now that there has been a decline in the marital rate and then we're seeing more and more seniors living alone. So I was wondering also if you have thoughts of looking into like mental health issues. Oh yeah, um, yeah, so, uh, Sorry, can you remind me the first question again? Technology. Yeah, right. So, yeah. So, I don't. I mean, I don't have a a, a good uh, a good answer, but I have some speculation. So, I think that uh, people in the lower middle are uh, a little bit more in more manual jobs, more jobs that might have higher risk of automation, things like that. And so, I think that is definitely could be part of the driver. Uh, that's just speculation. Um, and then in terms of housing, yeah, I definitely think it's important to think about things like loneliness um, and because we know that that can have impacts on health as well. And so I think that's definitely a really good point uh, to continue looking into in the future. We haven't looked at that yet, but I definitely think that's important. Okay, great. Um, well, I think, uh, oh, sorry. One more question if we have oh, time. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, one, one of your last charts you had uh, wealth value at age 60 and then present value of different types mm -hmm. of resources and you showed that for the lower middle it had basically stayed flat but there had been an increase for the upper middle mm -hmm. what do you from the data that you looked at what do you think accounts for that increase for the upper middle why do they have more now than they did in 94 I think so that's mainly coming from their continued increase uh, in earnings so this is so uh, they're retiring a little bit later, and they're also continuing to have increasing earnings, and so that's uh, where the majority of their gain came from, uh, is just their, their private incomes. And then their wealth, as you saw, declined a little bit, uh, and their, their social security income uh, increased a little bit uh, proportional with their uh, earnings, but I think it's mainly driven by that private income. Okay, great. Well, thanks. Uh, I think we'll turn it over now to the next presentation. Thanks very much. I'm David Rakoff uh, from Stanford. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak here. It's a real joy to be here today with you all, and uh, looking forward to the discussion afterwards. This is going to be a pretty uh, quick, uh, high-level talk. Just have 10 slides, about 10 minutes. 
Uh, I'll, I'll leave a minute at the end for any sort of kind of clarifying technical questions, and then we can kind of get into the deeper issues and the discussion and the implications when we get to the panel. Um, so this is work with uh, Frank Furstenberg, uh, Chris Jackson, a statistician I work with at Stanford, and uh, Jack Rowe, uh, with a lot of contributions over the past year or so from the um, Aging Society Research Network. So our study goal is to examine well-being by economic status using data from CDC's BRFAS data. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with that data. There's a lot of uh, advantages of using that data for this purpose. Uh, it's a nationally representative yearly cross-sections of the U.S. population with a total sample size over the years that we're looking at of around 6 million individuals. So it gives us a lot of statistical power for really looking at pretty stable trends um, over time permits comparisons of ages across time because it's sampled in the full population. Um, this is data that's typically used by health departments and the CDC for monitoring the health of the population. So uh, questions that are intended to do that, even though they aren't super in-depth questions, as you'll see. Um, so we define economic status to be uh, consistent with the work that you just uh, saw pre uh, presented from uh, Chapel et al. Uh, so we use household income here. And we categorize by yearly income percentiles um, by age category. So importantly, we are looking at these percentiles both by year and by age. So we have this even distribution over time. And the fact that earnings are very different by age, we want to kind of take that out of the trends that we're looking at. So we use these same characteristics of um, uh, upper middle, lower middle, higher and lower, um, you saw in the prior work. And then we look at it in our work fully across age categories, but here I'm going to be presenting um, three age categories that are most relevant, I think, to the discussion today and kind of the pre-retirement, early retirement ages, uh, 50 to 59, you know, comparing to the work that was just presented, but also sort of the younger, uh, younger age category than that and uh, older age category. So here's the three outcomes that we look at from the BRFAS data. These are self-reported um, data from uh, survey. First is physical health, which is measured by the number of days in the past 30 that physical health was not good. And then a similar question asking an individual about their own mental health. And then something that's similar but a little more functional in nature. The number of days in the past 30 that you're, either po you're poor, either physical or mental health, kept you from doing usual activities such as self-care, work, or recreation. So we're going to show six, uh, this is going to be very, uh, pr very simple models, very straightforward uh, descriptive work, but we're doing a few models kind of getting at your question earlier about are the trends we're seeing explained by changes in demographic factors um, over time. So the baseline model is going to be a simple year by income by age uh, interaction to look at those strata. But then we'll have model, present models that control for a few of these factors. So control for race, control for BMI, control for smoking, then control for those together, just to show and as we'll show that those don't explain anything in terms of the, the trends we're seeing uh, over time. We'll look at this for these uh, three outcomes and with a sample size of around uh, six million over this period of time. Okay, so I'm going to show uh, three uh, data slides, kind of main part of the presentation here, and I'll, I'll, I'll pause a minute and go through so you can kind of absorb this and see what's going on here. So first along the uh, horizontal axis, we have years going from 2003 to 2019. We have data up to 2022. We take that out here just to avoid the sort of um, any sort of influence of COVID, although I will say the trends are very similar when you keep uh, through 22 in. They just kind of continue in the same pattern. For younger, younger uh, age groups, you see it drop off from COVID for, and, and get much worse. Uh, for these age groups, you see it kind of continue with COVID. But this is just uh, 2003 through 2019. For the three age groups, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, which is the uh, focus of the prior presentation, then 60 to 74. The horizontal axis has the number of days people report. And so the range here is from around two days per month that your physical health was bad, going down to around 12 days per month. So this is a very big uh, range. If you think about this, you know, the total that this, the worst that this could be is 30 days. Um, and this is ranging from two to, uh, to 12. The income percentiles then, those groups we talked about, purple, the most affluent, going down to uh, red, uh, the lowest income level. 
So the first thing that stands out, of course, as we all know, but I think particularly dramatic here, this large degree of difference between um, the number of days in poor physical health by income level. So this gap of almost 10 days per month, if you're thinking about the 50 to 59 year age category. The second thing that's interesting is, uh, and very noteworthy, and I think the focus of a lot of our discussion, is if you look at the uh, lower middle, this green line in the 50 to 59, that's where we see the largest decline in the number of uh, days with poor physical health over this time period. So a difference going from around five days per month back in uh, 2003 to around eight days per month in uh, 2019. I should say don't, and then each of these lines is those sort of six models, so you can see there's really not much of a change after we control for race, BMI, and smoking. The trends are very, very similar. Um, the other thing to say, I don't show confidence intervals on here with around six million individuals total, confidence intervals around kind of the width of the line, so this is very pretty precise estimates of these trends over time. So now I'll show the same thing for mental health. Uh, the axis is different here. The range is now from around t uh, 2 to 10, um, but a pretty similar pattern, like less steep of a decline for this um, lower middle group for people age 50 to 59, uh, but still a sharper decline, still a pretty severe decline, um, similar sort of picture for mental health. And now we have functional health, uh, also similar, but um, uh, steeper as well, more like the physical health. Um, the number of days ranging from around uh, two, again, to around 12. Big differences by income level, downward trends for most groups, but particularly strong uh, downward trends for the sort of 50 to 59, 40 to 49 year olds in these lower income categories. So as I mentioned, just to highlight now, uh, four kind of key findings, uh, these dramatic up to 10 days per month and consistent differences in morbidity by income level. Uh, no trends or uh, levels explained by any changes over time, the distribution of race, BMI, or smoking. Uh, the strongest declines, largest declines, uh, were for the poorest and lower middle class uh, income groups, and the with the declining trends greatest for the lower middle income households. Uh, and there were declines for all outcomes for all ages. So there's a lot of policy implications of this that uh, we can talk about in the panel, uh, but one of the one of the first that comes to mind and one of the most important is thinking about these trends in the uh, individuals who are 50, 59, uh, approaching retirement ages and having substantially worse health and morbidity than previous generations. Um, so that was it. Thank you for your time and uh, happy to take any clarifying questions on any of this. Thank you, that was very interesting. A little sad, but very interesting. Well, very sad. Uh, I just have one quick clarifying question. So for the older, the difference between the middle and the older group, you think that's a, so partly a selection effect? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it is selection. I mean, there's not, you know, there, I mean, mortality rates at that age are still pretty low. There'll be a little bit of mortality, um, so that could play a little bit of a role in it. I think if we did the math on it, it's not going to be explaining a huge part of it. I think it's a little bit more of a cohort difference, but we could certainly do the math on that to formalize it. Yeah, thanks. Um, you, you mentioned that the different lines, different line styles in the graph yeah. for the different models, right? Yeah. And it looked like the differences between the lines were greater in the mental health graph. Is mm -hmm. that right? And do you have any interpretation of that? Yeah, I can, I can look back at that quickly. Um, yeah, there was a, yeah. I'm not going to overinterpret that, yeah. <laughs> but we can look at the exact numbers. I could send those to you and we could take a look. Uh, yeah, we got one minute more. I think one or two more questions. Uh, again, looking back at those graphs, yeah. the the oldest group does like the levels seem to to dramatically change. There is it is it really the same question about functional health for that group, or is it is there some other sort of relative to your the rest of the people in your age group? Is that is it hmm. how wh why are those 
why are functionally people in their 60s healthier than those in their 50s? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great, so th there's one that it's just that this is a real cohort difference we're seeing with this cohort of 50, 59 year olds and 60, 74 year olds that they're just better off functionally. Another good, uh, another possible explanation that you mentioned is people are answering that question you know, in a way that's like relative to uh, people their age. I mean, it's design. It's not designed that way. It's the the question is just you think about your daily life. You think out of those thirty days, how many days couldn't you do something? So it isn't attempting to get at that, but that could be part of the way people are interpreting it. Yeah. Uh, I think we're. I'm supposed to wrap up, but I don't know. One question or wrap up? What do you think? <laughs> okay, one more question and then wrap up. Hi, uh, Carl Polzer. I, it's, I have a project called the Center on Capital and Social Equity, and I advocate for the bottom 50%, so different category. Um, I, in terms of policy, which I hope the panel can address, I was very surprised there's that big of a gap about physical problems between the income levels. And is one of the possible drivers the fact that people at the bottom are less likely to have coverage, health coverage, and if they do, less likely to have paid sick days so they can use the coverage without taking a pay cut? And that's a big issue before state legislatures right now, at yeah. least in Virginia. Right, thanks. Yeah, I think that's, that's one of the top up explanations on the table. I think one of the, we can get this uh, more in the discussion, but one of the great things about Burfus data is it's representative of at the state level. So we can look at any sort of state differences in policies over time and see how much they might explain this. I can't say in work we've done looking at state-specific trends, there's a lot of, lot of heterogeneity in those trends uh, when you look at uh, it by state. So some interesting things to potentially discover there. Thank you. Assemble here. While we're assembling, um, I'm Jack Rowe. I'm uh, chair of the Aging Research uh, Societal Aging Research Network, which has been mentioned a couple times. This was a is a group that was assembled very generously by the MacArthur Foundation well over a decade ago. And uh, we continue to work together closely and generate various kinds of projects, including the two you've seen. About half of the network is here today, including Axel Borsupon from Munich and Cynthia Chen from Singapore, Frank Furstenberg from Penn, Lisa Bergman from Harvard, Dana Goldman from USC, David and myself, so uh, I, I'd have to say I think we're coming close to 15 years total. Uh, this has been uh, really one of the most remarkable professional and intellectual experiences of my career, working with this very generative group. There really is something, to, uh, and Tony Antonucci from Michigan, uh, there, there really is something to be said for interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. I'm going to have uh, each of the panelists uh, introduce themselves and uh, we're going to try to focus this discussion on what some of the drivers are of some of the findings that we've seen. Uh, we've seen two complementary studies. Um, after our initial comments, uh, we'll take questions. There are QR codes on the tables and those of you uh, watching remotely, which I'm told number approximately 500. Uh, encouraged to use the QR code to, to provide us with your questions. And we'll try to organize those in some way so we can get to the major, major themes. Um, I think with respect to the issues of drivers, there are some hints in what we've seen. Uh, yeah. Home ownership, surprising insurance, access to care, notwithstanding the ACA and Medicaid expansion, somewhat surprising, although maybe the lower middle class is not eligible for Medicaid. So. Um, but other things that don't seem to have much of an effect, like obesity, 
race being. So, uh, education. The smoking changes were pretty dramatic, so we have to try to understand what effects that might be. I think one of the, for me, one of the interesting things in this area, and then we'll move to the panel, is that there tends to be a lot of emphasis on the presence of chronic diseases in these kinds of studies, but I think Eileen Crimmins and others have shown that while many of these chronic diseases may be present, uh, they're being managed much more effectively than they were 20 or 30 years ago. So yes, you have hypertension, but it's much more likely to be controlled. Yes, you have hypercholesterolemia, but it's better controlled than diabetes and so on. And in fact, the actual risk profile of many people with these chronic conditions is actually less than 30 years ago, people without uh, of the same age. So that uh, so there's a, a been a shift in the severity. Uh, of the uh, the risks associated with these current diseases, so I don't know how to take the data from that. But let's move ahead. We'll start with you, and please, we'll move right down to Wendell, and uh, just uh, an intro, and then a couple thoughts on, from your point of view, what you think might be some of the important drivers. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you very much to um, our host today and also to the presenters for the terrific um, uh, data that you shared earlier. Uh, my name is Tisa Sherry. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Behavioral Health Disability and Aging Policy uh, in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, or ASPE, at HHS. So that was quite a mouthful. Um, but um, you know, briefly, um, uh, to describe what ASPE does and what our office does within it, um, ASPE, for those who aren't familiar, um, is the principal advisor to the Secretary of HHS on policy development. Um, we conduct policy research, and we also coordinate major policy initiatives across HHS. Um, my office, Behavioral Health Disability and Aging Policy, focuses on research and policy coordination to improve the health, well-being, um, and support the independence of people with mental health conditions, substance use disorders, uh, disabilities, and older adults. Um, in addition, um, we are um, kind of the point office um, for coordination on issues related to people who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, um, and um, we work with other partners in ASPE to coordinate the department's work related to um, housing and homelessness, um, and also um, the needs of returning community members who are recently incarcerated. Um, so that is the lens um, from which um, you know, I'll be sharing some perspectives um, today. Obviously, based on the populations I described, there's a tremendous amount of relevance and overlap um, with the findings that you know, we shared today. Um, you know, if I were to kind of briefly offer um, just some thoughts on what some of the key drivers are, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, so much, I think, comes down to um, basic inequities in the social determinants of health that are really kind of driving some of the fundamental differences we see both in the incidence of chronic disease, um, but also in the severity and in people's ability to access effective treatment. Um, certainly from my perspective, not surprisingly, um, and you know, an office that really focuses on behavioral health, um, you know, one thing that um, you know, I have kind of remarked upon is the growing burden and prevalence of behavioral health conditions, substance use disorders in particular, and trying to understand um, how that may be modifying some of the relationships that we've seen. And I think in particular, you know, the results that we just saw um, about um, how, um, about the increasing burden over time in cohorts um, of behavioral health conditions and their impact on functional status really raises questions about you know, some unmeasured or underestimated impacts of that comorbidity between behavioral health conditions and physical health conditions that may be contributing, but also the interplay with financial security and economic status um, and how those changes may also be driving the underlying incidence of behavioral health conditions and its modifying impact um, on these um, uh, outcomes. So I think from, that's what from I that thought. point of view, it's interesting in the data that uh, David showed uh, the patterns with respect to uh, the overall functional question, his third dependent variable, looked almost exactly like the pattern for the mental health variable, but not the physical health variable. Yeah. And so there, there might be a clue there. 
uh, with respect to that in interaction. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your comments. Erwin, welcome. And, uh, and as you tell us uh, who you are and what you've done, uh, please make sure you tell, tell us a bit about uh, the colleagues at AARP's work on uh, geographic disparities, because that's something we haven't touched on at all. Thank you, Jack, and thank you to the hosts and to the researchers. That was really interesting. Erwin Tan, I'm the Director of Health um, at Thought Leadership at AARP, a geriatrician by training, and my work focuses on uh, disparities and healthy longevity. Uh, we did a research that was published earlier, um, late last year, uh, that was done using data from IHME, the University of Washington, looking at life expectancy at age 50, because we're AARP, um, and we looked at it from a period of 2000 to 2019, so a 20-year period of time, looking by race, ethnicity at the county level across the 2,000 counties across the U.S. And we found was, similar to the data that was shown today, there was a general increase in life expectancy across the U.S., but there was also an increase in disparities. And I think that's the first piece, that the inequity, the disparities, is part of the driving issue um, across income and also across life expectancy. And if you look at the group that had the worst experience over these 20 years before COVID, Native Americans had no statistical increase in life expectancy at age 50 over a 20-year period of time, right? And they also had the greatest disparities in geography. So within Native American residents of the 3,000 counties, the best and worst um, counties in terms of life expectancy for Native Americans, that disparities increased. But what was the second group that had the worst trend? And that was actually white residents across the, the U.S. So the second lowest, it was, there was an increase in life expectancy for white residents, but it was um, the worst among all the racial ethnic cohorts. And also, you also have the, the second greatest increase in geographic disparities. So that leads to my second point, that geography, I think, is important because many, we're talking about the built environment. We're talking about housing. We're talking about uh, the air we breathe, the, um, the where we can walk, the food we eat. And so that might be an interesting piece when the National Academies looked at increased mortality at midlife across, I think, from a, uh, 2010 to 2014, they saw an increase in the life mortality. And it was focused in three general regions across the U.S. One was um, the Ohio River Valley, Appalachia. Um, and that was often, um, you know, and each of these regions had slightly different reasons. One was the Inner Mountain West, and one was the Southeast U.S. And in the Southeast U.S., that's where you see cardio, cardio metabolic um, deaths being a main driver. And that's where you see the greatest racial disparities. But in terms of mental health, you see in, in uh, Appalachia, Ohio River Valley, and also across uh, Intermountain West, that's where you see mental health, substance abuse, poisonings also being important drivers. So that's an important piece. I think the other thing that I think that's, uh, we have to consider is how do we define this economic group? It's a group that, that primarily has most of its wealth from income, as you stated. And the disparities in income are associated not only with the income at any age, but also the length at which you can, can as we like to say in ARP, as um, the length of time you can work or need to work as you age, right? And, um, and I think we should consider the workplace as a social determinant of health. And I want to just point out the work that Lisa Berkman and her colleague um, uh, Beth Truesdale did. There was a book that you all released this past summer uh, over time talking about the need to work longer in the United States. And I think what was interesting is the work that, um, that, uh, that, uh, that Chuzale did in terms of um, that if you look at people and their course of work in, um, from 50 to 60, only 50% of people have continuous employment from age 50 to 59. And there are actually three cohorts, people who don't work at all, often due to health reasons, people who uh, are intermittently working, and people, the 50% are able to work. So one strategy might be to move the people who are unable to work to give them intermittent work and the people who are intermittently working to, um, to move them to continuous work because that work pattern will dictate your work trajectory in your 60s onwards. And the last piece is um, a work that the National Academies did, the Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity. It was released about two years ago. Um, your, um, uh, Linda Freed um, um, at Columbia uh, was one of the, um, the chairs of the, uh, this consensus report. And it really describes healthy longevity as a societal um, experience and provides a roadmap to achieve health longevity by 2050. So with that, I'm going to pause and look forward to hearing from the other panelists and the conversation. Thank you, uh, Erwin. I, I think the, uh, the lessons from the roadmap, the National Academy roadmap, uh, which I was privileged to participate in, are really 
uh, very instructive here in terms of trying to set some of the possible framework for, for future work, very much life course oriented, very much global oriented, whereas all this work was domestic. Um, it, you mentioned the geographies and you mentioned the southeast, the so-called stroke belt, where you see the cardiovascular. Uh, uh, my, my understanding is in the, in the data from David's presentation, an initial, I initially assumed that the stroke belt was going to pop off the chart and uh, we couldn't find it. Interesting. Uh, in those data, and we have an N of six million. You uh -huh. know. Uh, so, it was, it, so it deserves more attention, yeah. but it was interesting uh -huh. that it didn't pop up because I said, well, if there's ever a region that's going to pop up, that's it. Um, Young, uh, very interested in your thoughts, particularly uh, with respect to the the home ownership issue, where you saw the data uh, from Jack's study there, uh, and uh, what do you think's going on there, and what what role do you think that's playing? Yes, so um, thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jung Choi. I'm a principal research associate at the Housing Finance Policy Center at the Urban Institute. I also graduated from USC, so it's good to see some Trojans in the room today. Um, so I think like there was like so many fascinating numbers, but then as Jack mentioned, I'm a housing researcher, so I would focus my comments on what I see in the home ownership trends. Uh, and then we did see from the presentation that the home ownership rate for those in the middle, uh, low middle group dropped more significantly than those in the upper middle group. And also, as mentioned in the presentation, uh, home ownership is a critical source of wealth building in this country. And a large share of especially lower income families and uh, families of color hold a uh, majority of the wealth in home ownership and housing wealth. So um, that said, I just want to highlight one of the research that we did um, when I first joined Urban was to look at the age of buying your first home. And it really matters in how much wealth you have at the age near retirement. So our research finds that those who bought their homes before age 35, they have significantly higher housing wealth at age 60. So this actually suggests that the trends that we saw in the presentation will actually um, impact uh, the housing wealth for the lower middle group after they retire and they would have less wealth, housing wealth to rely on and tap into in case of, for example, health emergency. So why are we seeing this trend? So I did look into different data sources and we also find very similar trends that the home ownership rate of lower middle group dropped more substantially than the upper middle group. And um, there are a couple of factors, but I do want to kind of mention that we use different data set and then I did expand the age group to uh, 50 to 64. And then home ownership is typically calculated at the household level. So this are, these are all the numbers that I'm going to say right now is the household level data. So there's some differences between some of the um, research that we show. But I'm going to talk about three factors that um, mainly led to a decline in a greater home ownership decline among the lower uh, middle group. And first is, as we talked about in some of the Q&A, uh, shifts in marital composition. And the second one is uh, changes in racial composition. And the third factor is uh, increasing home prices due to lack of supply while the credit became more tight uh, following the Great Recession. So um, let's first focus on the shift in the marital composition. So in the ACS data, uh, the households had between 50 to 64. Um, both of the groups actually showed a decline in marital a share of those who are married, but it was more substantial that we see a greater decline among those in the middle, low, lower middle group. So among the lower middle group in 2022, only 37% of households are married. And in the upper middle group, we actually see that 60% are married. And as we know, our home ownership and marriage is highly correlated. So that is one of the main drivers that we're seeing a greater decline in the home ownership rate among the lower middle group. And the second factor is the change in racial composition. So we do see that in both groups, there has been a greater decline in the share of white households and an increase in the share of households of color. However, again, we see a greater uh, share of households of color concentrated in the lower income group. And then 
what is very interesting about home ownership is that even if you control for income, there remains a persistent racial home ownership gap. So I'm going to share you some of the numbers that I thought was pretty concerning. In, um, so first is um, in the lower middle group, we actually see that about 47% of black households were homeowners and 52% of Latino households were homeowners compared to 71% of white households. And the 71% of white home ownership actually is higher than the black and white home ownership rate in the upper middle group. So in the upper middle group, black home ownership rate was around 66% and Latino home ownership rate is, was around uh, 68%. So this shows that this is just that even after we control for income, there remains persistent racial disparities. And this is another factor that we have seen a greater decline in home ownership among the lower middle group. And the third thing is, as we know, that the home prices have really increased substantially in the past decades. Uh, in the past 10 years, uh, home prices um, double, so it increased by 100%. And during the same time, uh, inflation rate increased by about 30%. So we see that the home prices have really kind of substantially increased much relatively more than other prices. And this made uh, homes become more and more unaffordable, especially for the lower income group. And also what has been happening in the housing market space is that the credit became more tighter following the Great Recession. So those in the lower uh, income group with lower wealth and lower uh, credit, they face greater challenges in accessing uh, uh, mortgages and becoming a homeowner and really kind of gaining that huge uh, house price appreciation and gaining wealth during those past 10 years. Let me make sure I heard this right. The homeownership and among whites in the lower middle class was higher than in the upper middle class. So home ownership in the whites among the lower middle class is higher than the home ownership rate in the black and Hispanic in the upper middle and class. Black and Hispanic, okay. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Wendell, you're an expert on the financial security of older persons. <clears throat> it, it seems like this lower middle class group is, they have too much resources to get Medicaid, low-income housing, food stamps, etc., but they don't have enough to live. Uh, and do uh, um, have any thoughts or insights about the prevalence of this insecurity, the, the impact of it over time, the kinds of Social Security and other initiatives that you're familiar with that that might be useful? Uh, well, thanks. I'll get to that question in just a minute. I, I, I want to say one or two things uh, about the reports. I mean, I find both of them quite discouraging and quite sad. I mean, yeah. uh, no, we're, 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 we're here to inform you, but not to make you happy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I guess the, 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 in the first report, the, the thing I found most troubling was the trend in home ownership that you just talked about. And also the table two where we've had an increase in the number of chronic conditions, the increase in poor re or, or fair reported health, increase in frequent pain and the growth in obesity. And in the second report, I mean, there wasn't a frickin' line that went up. I mean, they all went down. And, and guess, that's not his personality. No, I, I, have, I work with him all the time. He's really quite an upbeat guy. You know? <laughs> so I, I, the thing that came to my mind again in, in the health, I mean, I look to nutrition. I mean, I think nutrition, I don't have evidence, but I've got to believe that that has got to be a driver here in terms of, of health. I mean, you know, I think due to the ACA, more people are, are having health insurance. I mean, our decline in the number of uninsured is quite dramatic, um, et cetera. Um, but now to your question, um, you know, I think, um, I mean, there's clearly things we got to do about Social Security. I mean, the, the trust fund is running out of money in 2033 or thereabouts. Uh, and I think, I mean, that's why I'm at the Brookings Institute right now. I've been for many years with uh, the Speaker Pelosi. Um, but I guess I would look to increase the EITC among, child, among singles and childless couples. Um, I think we can also 
do things to the SSI program, um, maybe disability. And, and I think there's other things we can do um, to increase financial security, particularly in the older years. Um, Jack and, and I are, Jack Smulligan at Urban here, and we're working on a series of papers uh, looking at SSI, Social Security, and, and the like. Um, I think we've got some issues. We've got to extend the subsidies that were enacted. Um, they end at the end of 2025. Uh, we've still got 10 states that haven't expanded Medicaid. Um, so I think there's a, a whole slew of things that we can do to increase uh, financial security among the low to middle income uh, elderly. But it doesn't really help the 53 to 58 year olds. I mean, you know, Social Security kicks in at age 62. I mean, obviously there's disability and survivor protection, but most people, and you know, SSI, you have to be quite severely disabled. Um, you don't get old age protection until you reach That's right, yeah. 65, et cetera. So, uh, I mean, the, the thing that I think would help that group is really doing something about the earned income tax credit for for yeah, singles that's and very interesting. It does seem to me that the, the general policy framework has been we're going to take care of the poor and everybody else is okay. And that's not what we see here. Uh, we see that, that uh, the near poor are certainly not okay. And for me, the most striking finding was this kind of disjunction between the lines. I mean, the, 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 the near elderly and the lower income groups are skating to a place that is much worse place to be than the previous, the current elderly population started. They are not skating to where their parents' generation was when they entered late life. The, much worse, and the implications of that for workforce participation and Medicare expenses and so on and so on just seem to me to, to be dramatic. Um, we're going to take some questions. We can take them from the audience uh, here, and then we'll take them from the online audience. Uh, we, while somebody is deciding to raise a question and acquire a microphone, Erwin, I'll turn to you with one question that's popped up, and that has to do with hearing a little more from you about the nature of the workplace, uh, hazardous jobs. I've always been taught that it, you just can't work in mining or agriculture or fisheries uh, your entire career and not get hurt. You know, it just can't do it. Uh, so what is, you talked about the workplace, but uh, do you have any uh, perspective on the impact, in, particularly in the lower middle income people, of more hazardous workplaces? Yeah, and I think what we see, it's, it's, it's not only uh, what we define as hazardous workplaces, but just the general stress that accompanies work in general as well. I'm going to point to uh, 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 the work that uh, Dr. Berkman has done, among others, um, thinking about the stress associated with working. Uh, you know, uh, and often that's dictated by who your supervisor is, direct supervisor. Is Do you have a, a job that allows you to succeed at its mission? Um, and do you have, um, you know, uh, the social interactions, you know, whether they be with the customer base or with your colleagues, that can either help or hinder your ability to manage stress over time. And I think, you know, um, there are some interventions that, um, there's some clues that in changing the nature of the workplace itself, one may actually be able to um, affect, um, you know, the stress and, and then the impact of stress on the biological rate of aging. The other thing is all the benefits that are occurred by working uh, in certain jobs and not other jobs. And I think that's another piece as well, uh, the, um, and, and the, way, um, the way our benefits are structured in the United States, and in particular, um, the issue of health care. Um, so I think, um, I think the other piece is, you know, this is a lifespan conversation, right? It's about education. It's about making sure that people have opportunities mm -hmm. to pursue higher education and vocational education. At the same time, also, it's about how one creates uh, work ladders um, if you think about the jobs that potentially are at most risk for uh, replacement automation, who, who are, who's in those jobs and can individuals in those jobs be laddered, the idea of career ladders, from one job to another, from a home health aide to a licensed practicing nurse to a, 
you know, RN to a nurse practitioner. You know, like there are ways in which we need to think across the, um, um, the lifespan. Um, and so, and that's the piece here at ARP that we're interested in. It's, it's, not, it's, it's that lifespan approach that we need to take a look at working. And how do we sustain work to allow people to work as long as they want to or need to in, you know, and maintain health span, um, years of good health, in what we all hope will be an increasing number of years of life. Yeah, and for those of you interested in this issue, the kinds of jobs and the kinds of jobs policies, uh, Erwin referred to, <coughs> Lisa Berkman and Beth Truesdale uh, provided us with a, a volume uh, a year and a half ago from the Oxford University Press on title of which was Overtime, uh, which uh, I recommend to you if you're interested in this kind of issue, very comprehensive set of uh, essays on this. Axel, did you have a question? This is uh, Ax Professor Axel Borsupon from uh, Max Planck Institute in Munich. Yeah, thank you. I just want to follow up on, uh, on, on your remark on the life cycle approach. The life cycle starts at zero, right? Uh, and a lot of life expectancy is actually created in the very first years of life. Uh, and uh, I guess if, if we look for drivers uh, looking at that place, what has really changed in terms of education, uh, very early childhood education uh, would be an enlightening new project. It goes way beyond what we're doing here. Uh, but uh, if you really think about uh, causality of health, then uh, one has to start very early. Thank you. Lisa, did you have your hand up? Well, yeah, I was just uh, Dr. Berkman is the head of the Population Center at Harvard University. Um, so thanks, thanks for, the, for talking about the, about the work of work. I just wanted to say that the one thing that was really surprising to us was that um, so many people dropped out of the workforce in their 50s, and that if you were going to ask people to work longer, you absolutely had to do something. And we thought going into it that health would be the biggest driver. I certainly did, as an epidemiologist, that health would be driving this. And I would say that it was only one of things, and it was not the major thing, so that all the other people on this panel who do policy work, those were the policies. It was workplace policies that had to do with precarious work, scheduling control, long work hours, hard jobs for people in lower middle class jobs that just needed to stop working sooner, and disability, um, inflexibility, you know, like very, very tight disability um, sort of laws um, and policies, and work family, fair work week, um, you know, the impact of family on work, and those were the the actually larger drivers than health. So I just think of health as one of the outcomes, that work is a social determinant of health. It is also true that health determines work. And, and very interesting that trends we, we saw in the data that Jack Chappell presented of a, of a reduced uh, proportion of men in the lower middle class actually working mm -hmm. over time, over the last 20 years or so. We could do something about that. Yeah. Erwin, you had a, and Wendell, go, please. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've, we've done some work, and the thing that I think is quite interesting is how much life expectancy changes between the top uh, earners versus the bottom. I mean, that gap, according to a National Academy of Science, and I think Byron Tysinger, am I saying your uh, name correctly, has looked at that, and that gap is 12 years between those you know, high earners versus low earners. And to me, policy-wise, that's suggesting that we shouldn't be raising the retirement age. Maybe raising the retirement age at the top, but dearly, uh, clearly not at, at the bottom. And I think that thinking about uh, what sustains work across life course is also, I think, very important. Um, family issues, I think you talked about, are being important, whether it's caregiving for children or caregiving for, for parents, right? Um, thinking about um, uh, Monday drivers for disparities in income for men versus women, thinking about you know, um, child rearing and, and, and those burdens as well. But at the same time, many more men are also being caregivers at later life. Um, and having that sense of control over your workplace as, as, um, as technology has increased, as workplaces have been able to um, you know, extract more or manage the hours um, and push risk of like, you know, are you working or not? Um, push those, that risk of, 
of having time when you're not working um, onto the employees in terms of like, or the or gig economy. I think those are all things that we need to consider if we want to support people being able to work longer uh, with, uh, when they, as long as they want to or need to throughout life. And I think that that's, um, those are important pieces about the workplace as a social determinant of health. We have a, a question that relates to this uh, theme. Uh, one of our colleagues says, uh, my organization primarily serves single female heads of household, maximizing their incomes, um, often full-time and multiple part-time jobs. Sounds familiar. Uh, many of the classic strategies that promote economic mobility and wellness either don't move the needle for such families or require a commitment of time and resources that just isn't feasible. Uh, and are th there uh, innovative strategies that any of us uh, are aware of that might uh, be effective with respect to these families? I think Wendell's comment about the earned income tax credit might be relevant here, but there, there certainly might be others. Well, the other one that comes to mind is the child tax credit. Uh, you know, we, we took that away from very low income, uh, low earning households. The, the House just passed a bill uh, doing something about the child tax credit, but I would look to that to really reduce poverty among children because um, uh, we had reduced it considerably in 2021 and then um, the child tax credit got reduced. Thank you. Any other comments on that? Tony, did you have a question? Dr. Antonucci from the University of Michigan. First of all, I, I want to say I'm so happy to hear everybody talking about lifespan issues. As, as a lifespan developmental psychologist, I've been at this for a long time, and it's catching on. I'm happy to see. Uh, but interestingly enough, I, I want to talk about something completely different, which is that we're just finishing a project on the future of work and co connectivity in the future of work, in which our major focus was remote work. And we did a couple of studies uh, using SCA's uh, the consumer survey attitudes and some other data that were available to us. And I think we have a revolution happening here. And it is um, discordant across income groups. So guess who can't work remotely? Those lower middle that you were talking about, right? They, they have jobs that are very in-person, can't be changed. but. There is a big group who's now working remotely, and it changes everything. It changes like the ergonomics of the situation. It changes their family relations. It changes what they can do, what the hours they work. And some of it's good. I mean, some of it, people are reporting that they're working more hours and they feel more productive. But I think we are all now just beginning to recognize this and thinking cross-sectionally, but I think it's going to be a longitudinal issue. So what is it like if you've never been in an office? And we've all heard about office buildings not being occupied anymore. What is your, what's it like if your whole work career is with no face-to-face -face contact? And what is it like for your progression uh, across your work life and your lifespan? So it'd be great if you guys have any thoughts about that. Thank you, Tony. Thinking about the University of Michigan uh, reminds me of the work of uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Arlene Geronimus, in this area. Um, Geronimus has uh, been espousing the theory of weathering. Uh, she gives the analogy of a, of a stream or a river uh, gradually smoothing a stone over time, wearing away uh, the levels. Um, and, and thinks about individuals in situations such as the groups we're discussing who are under chronic stress. And uh, we're all familiar with the volumes of physiological data associated with the adverse effects of chronic stress and increases in cortisol levels and other mediators and, and uh, the end organs being every organ you have. Uh, and uh, uh, leading either to the emergence of disease or complications of disease. And uh, I think there's a lot more that we can learn about what the actual 
physiological and pathophysiological mechanisms are of this chronic stress, whether it's food insecurity or workplace insecurity or whatever, uh, and ways that we could mediate that. I think there are policy mediators like Social Security, but there might be physiological mediators uh, that could be helpful as well. Other questions? Yes, Sarah. Thank you. A comment and a question. Um, the comment is amongst the things that this makes me want to look further at is also the changing composition of the labor market itself, um, particularly what kind of jobs are available. That demographic change of workforce participation in the 50s amongst uh, lower middle men is a phenomenon that our former urban trustee David Otter has written a great deal about and is a group for whom uh, the availability of the jobs that many of them had earlier in their careers went away. There's a new spike in manufacturing jobs that we're starting to see post pandemic, but generally speaking, those jobs have been eroding. Those are employment that uh, men have typically had and there's a whole set of issues around occupational segregation that is another area where I would think we could do some interesting um, interrogation to understand um, what's driving some of these health phenomena. Um, I wanted to ask just Marie actually to uh, chat a little bit about where you sit in the federal government right now and I know you're very focused on issues of mental health and substance abuse and how they may be driving some of these outcomes. Um, I'd be curious your reflections and also what is the kind of current agenda. I, there's a big mental health push from the administration and how do you see any of that effort connecting, if at all, to these phenomena? Thank you. Uh, so I, uh, there is indeed a really big push, and I see it connecting a great deal. Um, you know, I, I, again, I think the, the presentation we shared showing these gradients in, um, in behavioral health um, were really very striking. Um, they also align with what we know as a long and large body of research clearly demonstrating income gradients related to mental health and substance use disorders. Um, but also importantly, um, among older adults. Um, there's a lot of discussion and discourse about um, you know, the significant behavioral health challenges that our youth are facing. And, and indeed, and that's an incredibly important um, you know, area of focus and policy priority. But we can't forget in all of that that um, it, indeed, there is also a very high burden of behavioral health challenges among older adults and also um, adults in midlife too. Um, you know, among um, uh, people age 50 plus, um, you know, it's estimated that 15% had any mental illness in the past year. Uh, you know, we know that substance use rates are a little bit lower in older populations than among young adults. However, they have been growing. Um, you know, at least as of 2018, there were um, a million adults estimated over the age of 65 who have a substance use disorder. Um, and the you know, percent of older adults in that uh, using substances has increased from about 19%, I believe, in 2012, up to 30% in 2019. So, you know, when we look at these sorts of trends, it's not surprising in some ways that we are seeing, um, you know, growing numbers of people reporting challenges and also um, increasing impacts on their functioning. Um, so the other the other thing I would say about this, and this kind of connects a couple of different areas of what um, our office is working on, but also administration priorities um, with regards to not just substance use disorders and um, behavioral health, but also with caregiving and aging. Um, you know, I, the, the current kind of behavioral health challenges we're having, um, I think they could be thought of in terms of their direct impacts on the people who are the older adults who are experiencing behavioral health conditions, and those are very striking, of course. You know, in one example, um, uh, suicide rates, um, the largest increases we've seen in recent years have been among older adults. Um, and of course, behavioral, uh, mental illness and substance use disorders are key risk factors that drive that. Um, so clearly, um, you know, there are significant impacts on the people themselves um, who have these conditions. But you know, the broader public health challenges as they affect younger generations also affect older adults. And as an example, um, you know, the um, uh, over 100,000 uh, primarily younger people who we are um, still use, losing to overdoses every year in this country, unfortunately, um, 
you know, um, a number of those are, th those are somebody's children. Um, you know, what that means is that, unfortunately, we have a growing number, at least in recent years. We certainly hope that's going to go down. We're doing everything we can to reduce that. But, you know, at least over the recent years with the historic increases we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic and overdose deaths, there's an increasing number of um, people who are approaching retirement age who, um, you know, don't have their child anymore, um, you know, and don't have the joy, the resilience, but also the uh, potential future caregiving support and also the additional economic security that comes with having that member of their family. I think that's something to factor in also to what we're seeing in terms of future trends and how this will play out. You know, even among people who have not lost a child to overdose, they may have a child who is um, you know, significantly functionally impaired by a substance use disorder or other mental health condition. That's also going to affect you know, their future um, health and economic security, given that adult children are also such an important source of caregiver support. So, um, you know, I, I think in, in terms of thinking about how all of this affects older adults, there's the direct impacts, but there's also the significant indirect impacts, um, you know, which we project um, will influence them by, you know, the loss of a key source of their social capital and their economic support. To make matters even more complicated, unfortunately, a number of the people who we are losing to overdose and or who are struggling to fulfill um, you know, their parenting um, responsibility, a number of people who are losing are parents, a number of the people who are affected by um, behavioral health conditions um, and maybe, kind of, maybe struggling to fulfill their um, uh, parenting responsibilities, which also means that a growing number of older adults, grandparents may be raising their grandchildren. Um, so all of this is to say that I think there are uh, additional kind of ramifications um, that may affect some of these trends we're seeing and that may further complicate um, some of the caregiving challenges and also the economic and financial security challenges we're seeing in people in older ages. Yeah, I, I would say, <clears throat> just with respect to the question about mental health issues, that as we look at the data that has been, have been presented here, we should be cautious about uh, differentiating the, the physical function data and the mental health data. When I, I used to be a doctor and, you know, uh, I would see patients who would be complaining that they were weak or they were, didn't have any exercise tolerance or they were short of breath or they couldn't get out of bed or they couldn't do the stairs. They were depressed. Mm -hmm. okay. These are symptoms of depression. Indeed, and, yeah. and so there, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, it's not all overlap, but uh, but there's some overlap. So we have to have to consider that. We have uh, one comment here from a colleague who says, "I work at a foundation that funds programming to increase life expectancy. Could you prioritize where to invest funds, and which populations to focus on? What would be?" your suggestion regarding uh, this based on your research and experience? Well, uh, but I, I guess I would start by uh, telling this colleague uh, that my email is jwr2108 <laughs> at columbia.edu, and I'm happy to hear from you. And uh, our network would be happy to talk with you. But more seriously, um, I think the message here is that it's increasingly clear that it's about the generation that is about to enter late life. That, that there's been an important and needed focus on older persons. But you know, AARP was smart enough to start at age 50, not age 65. They understood uh, a long time ago. And, and the data we're seeing, the, the findings from Jack Chappell's work are very striking, but when you start looking at David's work and you look at the comparison of this pre-retiree generation to the existing retiree generation, you see some really dramatic differences and trends. And so I think we need much more, as Tony Antonucci said earlier, much more of a life course perspective. As Axel said, you know, aging begins at zero, and we just need to broaden our lens uh, with respect to some of these trends uh, rather than just focus 
on a time when perhaps the horse is out of the barn. Uh, the, there is a dramatic amount of work that can be done in the older age populations. I've spent my career doing some of that, but I'm increasingly uh, concerned about these next generation. You had a question, Miss. Um, I'm Caitlin Owens. I'm a reporter at Axios. Um, my question is primarily for Wendell, but I think anyone else can chime in. I think something that's really striking as I was looking at the data, um, I mean the time period, right? So I, Wendell, this is to you because this was the time period in which Part D was passed and implemented and then the ACA, um, which means more people had access to more forms of health insurance. And so I think that, you know, I don't, th I don't think the conclusion is that health insurance makes people less healthy, um, but it does seem to say something about, um, you know, insurance's role or access to insurance's role in the greater, like, health care making of the effort to make people healthier. Um, so I would just love your reflections on that. Um, just kind of, you know, yeah, the outcomes that we've seen over this time period when so much insurance progress has been made. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think necessarily having, I mean, having health insurance should improve your access. Uh, but I mean, even within some of the programs, like Medicare still doesn't have uh, uh, an out-of-pocket limit. Um, we have very high premiums on Medicare people, for example, at 150% of poverty, uh, an ACA beneficiary has no premiums. A Medicare beneficiary has over $2,000 of premium payments. Uh, I would say that's inequitable. But I think the things we're seeing in these papers, um, you know, the increase in chronic disease, et cetera, uh, you know, I really think, you know, maybe we have to follow what we did on cigarettes, you know, a, pub a messaging campaign as well as increase the tax. I mean, liver disease is a leading cause of death. We could we haven't raised the tax on alcohol for some time. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, the deaths of despair, um, guns, et cetera. I mean, I think there's a number of things we could do to target and try to reduce um, disease burdens, chronic disease burdens, et cetera. But that's, and that's would be in addition to uh, what we need to do on the health insurance side. Well, when it comes to the question of the utility of insurance, I mean, there is there, a fair amount of evidence to indicate that, that health insurance saves lives. Um, for me, one of the most uh, interesting bodies of data are the, the, the Oregon experiment by Amy Finkelstein at MIT and Kate Baker, now at the University of Chicago, where they were able to randomize people and, to, to medicate coverage or not, and and now have developed a fair amount of data over time on the implications of that and the outcomes. So that's certainly a, a very rich place to look. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. And I would um, add that, of course, having insurance is critically important. Absolutely agree that there is robust evidence in particular in support of the impacts of the um, Medicaid expansions under the ACA. Um, but also, um, uh, insurance insurance helps to make health care more affordable, but of course there is also additional progress that can be made. To your question, that's been one of the key driving foci, foci of this administration. Um, you know, for example, um, prescription drug costs and affordability. You know, with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, you know, and now um, we have uh, historic policy changes that can help address some of the key drivers of um, high health care costs, even among people who do have insurance. Um, last um, summer, the administration proposed new rules related to mental health parity to try to ensure that behavioral health care is more accessible and more affordable in the private insurance market. So I, you know, I, I would just acknowledge that um, there is certainly more to be done, um, you know, even among people who have insurance. Getting insurance is an, in, an incredibly important policy goal and achievement. There's more to be done among people who have insurance to ensure that they can still access and afford care. Um, and um, we're seeing some progress, I think, more recently that can be reflected in some of the slides that were shown. Um, and there's more underway, and there's more that will happen. I think also you look at the, oh, sorry. Yes, please. You look at the, the course of life expectancy since the beginning of the 
Industrial Revolution, we see a general increase, right, with notable um, blips like the you know, 2018 influenza, I think. Uh, and many of those gains were from public health, the social determinants of health, you know, pasteurization, um, seat belts, um, changes in, in, um, in cigarette policy, right? And now we, I think, are, are at a stage where I think the next steps in, in maintaining that increase are going to be more difficult. And those include increasing health span and investing in, in making sure that it's not only the years of life, but the life in those years that we increase. And part of it also is, you know, I think is also to include um, uh, the private sector as well, right? Um, uh, last year at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum, our CEO, Joanne Jenkins, talked about a business case for health and longevity, that if we are to imagine that there are worker shortages in some sectors right now, if certain employers were to be able to demonstrate that they are employer of choice, if, you know, if, if we were to try to change the nature of, the, of a very important social determinant um, of health, the workplace, to help sustain health and longevity, those are, those are ways in which we need to also engage, I think, the private sector as well. Um, but I, I um, so yeah, so I think that's, that's part of it, is that the, the gains that are gonna have to be multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. um, and they're gonna include you know, government, um, the nonprofit sector, and the private sector as well. We have, we have a question about ageism, and uh, the final common denominator, in my experience, of all discussions about aging is, comes to ageism. Um, but it's particularly relevant here with respect to the economics of aging. Uh, Erwin, uh, I think some of the nicest work on this has been done by Andrew Scott and his colleagues at the London Business School. Uh, and he's published some work with David Cutler at Harvard <coughs> looking at the economic impact of healthy longevity. Uh, the, the social capital as well as the longevity dividend, if you will, that can be extracted uh, if, if we can have an older generation which is capable of participating in the labor force or, in fact, volunteering, yeah. Yeah. which is good for your brain and good for your body, uh, and not just working for pay. But the data we've seen this morning suggests that we're going in the opposite uh, direction. Uh, thoughts about ageism, is that something you come across? I think it's something we have all come across. Um, uh, and, um, you know, importantly, I think um, one of our key goals is to ensure that we are putting in place policies and programs um, that really kind of help to demonstrate um, how unfounded it is, but also, you know, help to support um, older adults to really be able to live their best quality and most productive lives. Um, you know, those can include long-term services and supports to help them remain independent in the community. It includes access, uh, improving access to health care services um, to, again, kind of allow them to, to support management of chronic diseases to help, you know, continue their, um, it, uh, maintain their functional status um, and remain engaged in whatever pursuits are most important to them, um, if it's work, um, if it's um, interactions with other family members. You know, the goal around all of this this is to ensure that um, we're uh, giving people all of the tools that um, they have in a person-centered way to ensure that you know if they want to uh, work longer, they're able to do that. Um, you know if they um, uh, if they want to spend more time with their family, they're able to do that. If they want to be able to age in place in their own home, you know they're able to do that. And so a huge um, so so a key kind of unifying focus of all of our efforts across the department. Um, has involved that, but it does, I think, to Irwin's point, um, really require um, coordinated activity across multiple sectors and not just government, uh, uh, and even within government. Um, you know, from HHS's perspective, we approach this um, from our health insurance programs, we approach it, you know, from some of our other grant programs. Um, you know, for example, the the aging network, which is a critical critical source of support um, to um, older adults, funded through the Older Americans Act. Um, but a lot of what we do, um, uh, so many of the challenges that we've discussed today go beyond um, medical care. They go beyond health insurance. Um, they also relate to. Uh, deeper fundamental economic drivers um, uh, affecting financial insecurity and affecting social well-being. 
And to address those, um, we work in close partnership with a lot of our other um, uh, federal agencies. Um, I, just to kind of highlight one key example, I think, which gets to some of the great um, work that Dr. Cho Choi was mentioning. Um, we have partners very closely with the um, Department of Housing and Urban Development um, to set up the Housing and Services Resource Center, which is um, a, a really important uh, you know, technical assistance and educational resource um, uh, institute um, that um, provides information um, to housing um, uh, providers and also supportive services providers about how we can optimally, based on the evidence, integrate housing um, with supportive services to support this goal of allowing people as they age or people with disabilities to be able to live independently yeah. in their homes and in the community, um, get what they need to, again, you know, help um, combat this um, mistaken notion that um, you know, as people age, they somehow cannot continue to um, right. fully contribute to society. So I think part of the way that we combat that is that we give people who are aging the support that they need yeah. to do what they want to do. Young, do you have any comments about this issue of this co-location of, of health and housing? And yeah, I think I've really learned a lot from today's sessions because there's like so many different aspects of this problem. I do want to kind of highlight one thing um, that, so as we showed in the presentation that the share of homeowner who are uh, in the lower middle group have declined, that means the renter population have increased. And what we also saw over the past 30 years is that the housing cost of rental housing costs have also increased dramatically. So this means that more and more older populations who are renting are actually paying a disproportionately higher share of the income on rent. So then they don't really have enough money left over to kind of like maybe pay for other bills and like eat healthy food. So all these things are really, really interrelated. And then I think like in the housing space, the fundamental problem is that we really do have a shortage of housing supply, especially affordable housing supply, and we don't really have enough subsidies to support those who have lower incomes to have more like secure, affordable housing. But Myra, do you have a question? Actually, no, Jung just answered my question. I wanted to hear more about, about her work, so I'm good. Thank you. Can I just add something? About, uh, yes, go ahead, Erwin. Um, I, I, would I, yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about ageism. I think you know, our, our CEO, likes, um, Joanne Jenkins, likes to say 50 is the new 50. And that first mm -hmm. age is the chronological age. But the second 50 is how, what society lets you do. And I think there are economic benefits, what we like to call the uh, longevity economy outlook, that there are economic benefits to, to increasing uh, opportunities as people age, right? Um, and that both longevity, you think about the goods and services that households, you know, sort of um, led by people 15 and older, what that contributes to the economic, mm -hmm. uh, economic um, activity in the United States. There's, there's, there's an economic value to both increase health span and longevity and also to equity. I mean, you talked about the deaths at earlier ages and, and the loss of, and, you, and it really does speak about what we're talking about here, right? the deaths of parents um, at younger ages, you know, thinking about its birthdays, its anniversaries, it's the loss of wisdom, it's the loss of people who own homes where you can have multi-generational housing um, and loss of colleagues that can pass on wisdom. So there is a real, uh, you know, um, real uh, human cost to this as well, and as well as an economic cost. You know, you, people talk about 60 being the new 50, you know, the data we've seen today suggests 60 is the new 70. Uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, we've got to start to reverse engineer all our ideas we've been having about this great longevity dividend <laughs> and start thinking about how we're going to prevent things from getting worse. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, thanks. So um, listening to the panel and to the presentations before, the image it, it conjures in my mind is of two, two kind of flywheels that are separated exactly at the median income. And if you're above it, you're on the positive flywheel where you can you know, build some wealth and that'll give you more income in the future and so on, and you can make healthy decisions for yourself. If you're on the lower flywheel, it turns the other way. And you are, you are pushed back by, by chance, by things happening in your life. Um, the question I'm interested in is, 
you know, are these flywheels, they seem to be spinning faster than they were in 1994. The question I, I'm interested in is why. I'm, I'm from the Netherlands. I spent the last couple of years working at the Netherlands Institute of Mental Health. And one of the trends we've seen is that perhaps these wheels are spinning faster because of increased uncertainty in people's lives, in society. Um, you know, we hear people say that the life has become more complex in some ways. We, um, uh, we heard about the gig economy earlier, so fewer people have fixed jobs, more people have to find their work on a day-to-day -day basis. That's just one example of the ways in which life becomes more uncertain. Um, and that links, of course, to the work by Professor Bergman and others on, on control over your work, but also over other domains of life. So I'm, I would like to ask the panelists, is that an analysis you share? Can we say that life has become more complex or uncertain? Um, and, and how can we give people the tools to deal with that? I can maybe start with just like my observation in the housing market. So uh, what I said earlier is that the homeownership actually have become more and more difficult in this country for the lower and middle income people to access. First, because we have um, less affordable homes right now, we don't build enough. And the second is because the credit has tightened. But then the benefit of homeownership is so much greater than the benefits that renter households have. So we kind of, I think, created this distance where it's becoming more and more difficult to access home ownership, but then there is a wide uh, gap between uh, those who are left behind and those who actually success successfully become um, homeowners. And I think one of the very interesting thing about like the US homeownership market is that unlike many of the other markets around the world, we have this fixed 30-year fixed mortgage system, which really secures your monthly housing payment for a really long period of time. So that doesn't happen in the rental market space, though. So you don't really know. There's like this uncertainty involved in how much more rent would I pay in the next year. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the rental prices have also gone up a lot over the time. So that's actually creating a greater instability among uh, the rental households compared to those who are homeowners. Interesting. Interesting. I'm going to get back to volunteerism for a minute. Um, it's been neglected. It's very effective. It has very significant medical benefits as, as well as psychological benefits. Erwin, you've been involved in some of the volunteerism programs, well designed, but generally not adopted to scale. I think you might whether you agree or not on that, but the experience core, senior core, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts about the status of, uh, of these programs? It's interesting. We talk about ageism and perceptions of aging. The work of um, Becca Levy at, at Yale suggests that um, positive perceptions of aging are associated with a seven-year increase, predictably, of, of life expectancy. And similar other studies have suggested that per having purpose in life also a, provides a similar value as well. Um, and purpose can come from both employment and from you know, uh, 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 important uh, social relationships, as well as from volunteering. We do know that volunteers tend to live longer than non-volunteers. It's always been a question of, is there a selective bias there? But the work from Experience Corps, which is, um, uh, uh, I should say, is part of the ARP Foundation, um, there were, uh, I was part of a randomized control trial that was led by Linda Freed at, at Johns Hopkins at the time. Um, and we looked at the benefits and we saw that for the women in this, um, this initial study, there was increased uh, physical activity. Um, and for the men, uh, there was uh, sustained uh, hippocampal volume, hippocampus being the center of the brain that encodes memory. So there was really suggestion that there are, there's some value not only in being a volunteer, but the volunteer activity, which in this case was a quarter time um, AmeriCorps participation in the Baltimore City public school system where there was a potential for a win-win not only for the, for the, uh, for the uh, volunteers who are 55 and older in this study, also for the children who had less interactions with the discipline system in the schools uh, and a sort of case controlled analysis. So I think that, that there is that potential. Um, you know, uh, going back to Tocqueville, uh, it's the idea that there's something um, that um, social capital and the ability for us as Americans to come together through uh, volunteering, national service, um, that not only benefits society, and, but also benefits the individual. So I think 
there needs to be more uh, research on that, but there's also a lot of potential, and it has the potential also to be something that is a uh, um, have this broad non uh, nonpartisan appeal. Thank you. Yes. So a few of the speakers today have mentioned that there's been a decline in marriage, especially among the lower middle class cohort. And one of the panelists highlighted the strong correlation between marriage and home ownership. So I'd be interested to hear any of the panelists' thoughts on policy changes that could be made that would encourage marriage and would try to increase the marriage rate, because we know that that's associated with a lot of positive outcomes. Is there, uh, I, I don't know much about income tax. Um, is there a marriage penalty in the income tax? Would you know, Wendell? Um, yeah, but I don't think it's overwhelming. I'm not so sure it determines behavior. Uh, right. And uh, I think in the lower middle class, the proportion of people who are actually paying income tax is fairly low. I mean, they're, they're, the incomes are, are quite low, and the data I've seen is, is quite, so it would not, so at least from a tax point of view, I, I think that's probably not going to be an answer. The others in the panelists have thoughts about, about what's happening there with less marriage and I think that's what a great question, and this is just not like a U.S. problem. It's actually happening all over the world. Um, and I think, I actually think like in a lot of like, I'm from Korea, so in a lot of the Asian countries, what is happening is like, because like, for example, housing and home ownership has become so much more expensive, that's one of the core barriers that people kind of like delay marriages. Because in a typical Asian countries, like when you are married, you're kind of assumed to buy a home and then start a family in, um, and, and, and home ownership at the same time. I don't think that's always the case in the US, but then I would be kind of like, before we go into the policy solutions, like really looking at the drivers behind decline in the marriage, I think some of the financial instability that was shown in this presentation would also be some of the causes of delay in marriage, not just like, so there's kind of this, I guess, like what is chicken and egg problem here? But I think that's a really important question. I'm really interested in the phenomenon. But then I think before, like, I don't really have like a good solution right now because I'm kind of like still delving into what the core driver is for the lower marriage rate. But I don't know if anybody here or um, in the room have better thoughts on that issue. I would also, you know, suggest that we should be asking what more can we be doing from a policy standpoint to, standpoint to support um, people who are unmarried, um, who mm -hmm. choose not to get married or who get divorced or who lose a spouse, for example, and who are um, single um, at older ages. So I, I know that's not quite the question that you pose, but um, I think that is also an equally important one for us to better understand, um, you know, both from a research standpoint, what are the sorts of supports and policies that, you know, best support um, single older individuals um, and then, um, you know, ensure that our policies um, kind of align with and support that. Wendell, you mentioned the earned income tax credit, uh, <clears throat> which I know David is a huge fan of uh, and thinks has, is the answer to many of the problems we've seen. Uh, but one of our colleagues wants to know what else you have in mind in terms of income support uh, programs. Uh, you have any other thoughts uh, about things that you uh, you mentioned the child support program that might be reinvigorated? Are there others on your wish list? Um, well, there's a lot kind of in the in the Social Security world, the SSI world, etc. Um, and even in Medicare, I mean, I do think we ought to have an out-of-pocket limit. I think that out-of-pocket limit ought to be income-related. Um, so you could go through a lot of our programs. I mean, I think the one of the programs that's gotten the least attention and probably needs the most reform, in my humble opinion, is the unemployment insurance program. Oh. Um, you know, there's a lot of gig workers and stuff that aren't even part of the system anymore. Um, so, I mean, in... Again, you can go through all of our income security programs and suggest that 
changes that ought to, ought to be made. I mean, TANF is basically non-existent uh, at this point. Um, um, but I would, again, on and the other uh, thing I would, we have a lot of grandparents raising grandchildren, and I would argue that um, we ought to have a child benefit for those grandparents in the Social Security system. Um, um, those are some examples. That's interesting. There's an organization here in town, Generations United, which has been very effective in working with these intergenerational issues and, and uh, quite, quite striking increases in the, in the number of uh, grandparents raising uh, grandchildren. And of course, you know, there's, there's also this kind of belief out there, maybe it's part of ageism, in the world that um, we have greedy geezers and, and, and our society and the younger generations are supporting the older generations. It's actually quite the opposite up until I think around age 83 or something. The net transfer is from the older generation. The, the other thing about almost all these um, income security programs, we have very low participation rates right. I mean, in EIT. And the same with the volunteer programs. I mean, that's the nut you have to crack. It's one thing to have a, some people inside the Beltway figure out some fancy program, but to get, get these things to get to scale uh, requires funding and a commitment to do it. You can't just pass the bill, right? Um, other, how are we doing in time here? Where's my boss? Where is she? Okay. Uh, we may not need all that 10 minutes, but uh, we'll see. We have Axel first and then Tony next. Axel. I'm uh, Axel, by the way, as I recall, you were involved in, in the German government's reform of Social Security uh, in Germany, so you may also have some thoughts about these relevant prior questions. But go ahead with your comments. Well, please. I actually just wanted to say something quite different of a focus, uh, which uh, is kind of funny because I'm an economist, and after all, uh, exactly as you said, uh, uh, I have a lot to do with uh, pension policy in, uh, in Germany, but also in, uh, in Europe. But anyway, I, I wanted to say we should look more at uh, medical things here. Uh, and I wanted to pick up uh, what, what Jack said earlier. Uh, we, 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 we sort of have gotten used to, to look at uh, chronic diseases. Um, but I think we should look much more at uh, acute diseases here uh, and, uh, and see the uh, sort of interaction between uh, lower coverage by health insurance uh, and acute diseases, uh, particularly infections. Uh, and that may actually help us to, to find a little bit more of the causality while actually life expectancy went down and why uh, 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 morbidity uh, is expanding rather than, uh, than, than shrinking. Uh, so uh, I encourage the uh, medical profession. <coughs> Thank you. Tony. Actually, I thought Axel was going to talk about something different, a, con a concept that he's talked about in another meeting we've been together, which is social cohesion, which is uh, it's another concept not usual for economists, but Axel is a usual economist. I think we should talk about this. And I, I think uh, some of the topics we've talked about, so I think, the, I think a lot of policy is built around the nuclear family. And I think we have to rethink that. A lot of people aren't getting married. A lot of people are getting married for a short period of time. A lot of people are having multiple marriages. A lot of people are not having children. I mean, the core of a nuclear family, which most of our policy is built around, is just not really working anymore, and it's certainly not the majority. So I think we need to think differently, and we, think we need to think across the lifespan so that we're planning different trajectories, different stages, but without necessarily relying on the nuclear family. And I, I think it's possible. I mean, you could have different places. Even housing tends to be around a nuclear family, but people, especially after a certain age, don't live in that nuclear family, aren't housed that way. A lot of people who could afford houses 
don't want to own a house anymore because too much burden. They want to have more flexibility. So I think, really, it's another revolution we have to think about. Uh, we're basing our policy on nuclear family, but not everybody feels their future is in a nuclear family. And that, that certainly could be one of the drivers. You know, it used to be that the nuclear family was biological. And now it's kind of voluntary. Right? <laughs> you know, and uh, divorce rates of 50 percent and people spread out geographically, et cetera, et cetera. Irwin? I think that, you know, we know that there's a value in terms of life expectancy benefit for social capital, but there are different types of social capital. There is bonding social capital and there's bridging social capital. And I think what we need to think about is that bridging social capital in particular can also address the flow and expectations of trust in goods and services and, um, and, and wisdom of between communities can address issues like disparities. That's what was really exciting about the Baltimore Experience Corps uh, um, study that I was a part of with, you know, that you had an intergenerational experience, people volunteering and supporting people who weren't necessarily their own children. And, and I was in charge of recruitment for that trial. Um, and I remember talking to people and whether they would say, some people would say those children, some people would say our children. And whether, what pronoun you chose really determined whether you were interested in the study. And I think that's another piece as well. I think how do we then create an intergenerational social contract? How do we then increase the bonds of affection between uh, people that are our neighbors um, in terms of risk and life being complicated? Um, how do we share that risk increasingly with technology and data? Individuals, typically people who are poor, are bearing most of the risk, whether they're, you know, employees or uh, you know, and finding it out. It's expensive to be poor in the United States uh, because you have the rent versus having a, um, you know, the risk of um, a changing rents versus the stability of a, of a, um, of a, a mortgage. But I think that that question of how do we then um, increase the sense of uh, of social capital, particularly bonding, so, uh, bridging social capital, is an interesting point, and volunteering may be part of that. To, to finish up with a, a comment about drivers in general, um, and I think maybe this is uh, relevant to uh, a comment from our colleague about working at a foundation and looking for things to support. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that our group hopes to be able to do, um, we've done a fair amount of work on developing an aging society index, looking at at international comparisons of how countries adapt to aging. And I think we can extend that work um, to really do some international comparisons of the kinds of data we saw here this morning. We need to understand whether countries with stronger social services and support systems are seeing different experiences in the trends in these age and income groups. That's a natural experiment it's being conducted every day out there. We just need to get, get those data and, and compare them and analyze them in a robust way. But I think that that's going to be a very useful uh, step forward. Axel has his hand. Axel is the father of, the, of SHARE, the study of health and retirement in Europe. And perhaps he has uh, some thoughts about this. talking about causality, but if you look at life expectancy outcomes among lower middle class people, then the evidence is completely clear. Uh, in, in countries where you have a stronger social support system in Europe, uh, the life expectancy is higher than in the others. Um, yeah. Whether there's a causality is a much more difficult question, but the correlation is uh, yeah. and quite of course obvious. It, and, the, and the issue of decompression of morbidity rather than just uh, mortality. Well, it's never a mistake to end these sessions early. Um, and um, you've been all very, very generous with your attention and your uh, engagement. And I want to particularly thank uh, the staff for making this work so seamlessly and uh, for our panelists. Thanks very much for your thoughts. We're done. <laughs>